Thanks, for, first of all, for uh, inviting me. This is a joint war that has been going on for many years with this co-author and plus other. And this has been financed by Growing Pro, which is a project that has been financed by European Commission to kickstart productivity and GDP growth in Europe in the, the next year. Uh, so let me just make a one step back and talk about uh, generally about macroeconomics because from an historical perspective, just before the Great Recession, if you read the literature, there was this idea that we were very close to an end of macroeconomics. There was a lot of similarity with this idea of the end of history, the book of Fukuyama that was published after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Why was that so? Well, because there was this new consensus, the, neo the new neoclassical synthesis where new Keynesian and real business cycle people teamed up and created this DSG uh, model. And that was the period where every, there was a lot of research going on and where a lot of people talking about this idea of the great moderation. That is that after the 80, the standard deviation of GDP fell, there was much less volatile, and there was this idea that this was due because of very good monetary policy, and there was this idea again of the divine coincidence. That is, if you do inflation targeting, you stabilize inflation, and at the same time you are able to stabilize uh, the economy. Of course, this great moderation was followed by the Great Recession and indeed a complexity perspective is needed to understand them because the Great Moderation and the Great Recession can be considered as two sides of the same uh, coin. And now people even talk about the secular uh, stagnation. So what was the policy response? Well, in the very beginning, the policy response was using the discourse and the tool provided by standard macroeconomic models such as the DSG. Uh, so, and now we are facing problem. For instance, uh, everybody was focused on inflation, but now the problem for, especially for European Central Bank, is that it's not able to make inflation grow ag again towards 2%. Uh, central Bank have to use more and more unconventional tools like quantitative easing, and the effects are still uncertain, and there is a stronger case for fiscal policy. Even those, uh, just after the Great Recession, very, um, most of the economies were providing receipt for fiscal austerity. And this was grounded on this uh, fairy tale of the expansionary austerity or this possible 90% threshold that was the work of, in a debt GDP ratio that was created by Reinhard Terogov. Then later discovered there was some mistake in their Excel spreadsheet, but anyway. And, uh, and then there was a, uh, an estimation of the fiscal multiplier and what is very influential paper by Blanchard and League and by many others where they show that the fiscal multiplier are higher than what it was supposed to and what was coming from standard model and so that's why austerity policy were especially uh, painful. Uh, and uh, we know that the consequence of this austerity policy well, in many countries the GDP is still below the, the Great Recession, uh, Italy is one of the cases, uh, many uh, countries face jobless recovery and, and as far as UK is concerned there is, was a recent paper that was linking the how, how hard were austerity policy in different local areas in the UK on how people voted for the Brexit. So there is a possible connection also for the political uh, scene. So here uh, I think uh, Alan maybe was one of the first, but uh, there were also many others that were starting making the point after the crisis that the Great Recession was a crisis for macroeconomic theory. And then you need to refound the macroeconomic theory on a different perspective, especially using uh, uh, a complexity perspective. So there is this nice paper by Stiglitz where you can pick up some ingredients that modern macroeconomics should have, like considering distribution and inequality, the role of credit market and the possible feedback from the financial system to the real side of the economy, the fact that the market does not clear and you have to carefully model them with the centralized interaction and that rational expectation doesn't work and people follow heuristics and, uh, and so on. So this started a movement for having a much more pluralism in macroeconomics and there was this idea of having also this complex system approach. I've, be, I've uh, written a couple of, uh, uh, of papers on that, a survey where we make this, uh, this case. And even there is an increasing interest in central bank. There was this famous speech by uh, Trichet just before he resigned. So you can, if you want, you can also make connection between Agen Beige and the fact that he resigned. And there was another nice paper by Andy Aldane and, uh, and Arthur, uh, both in the GEC and the Oxford Economic Paper about pluralism in uh, uh, economics. And indeed they have this very nice picture where they make the case that central banks, but in general policymakers, should use different tools. That is not only dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, but different type of 
econometrics model from the vector autoregression of old-fashioned structural econometric model and also a gem based uh, model. Um, even the economists talk about a gem based model, so I will try to give you an idea of what you can do with an agent based model for assessing uh, fiscal and uh, monetary policy. Why this model can be useful? Well, because you get for, you get for free, every time you use an agent based model, interaction and heterogeneity. So you can model this in a very natural way and uh, contrary to standard DSG model, with an agent based model you can also replicate all the possible micro and meso uh, empirical stylized factors. Uh, so, uh, I'm showing you an example of, of the agent based model that we have been developing in PISA, the Keynes plus Schumpeter agent based model, that has this name because it's put together both Schumpeterian theory of innovation, structural change, and long run economic growth, so you have endogenous growth, plus a Keynesian theory of uh, business cycle, so you also have endogenous business cycle together with deep uh, downturn. And here you can study the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy, study the long run and the short run impact, and also for different scenarios, and in particular we try with inequality uh, scenario. Just to give you the type of policy that we are going to test, we are going to test different type of monetary policy in terms of Taylor rule, so more focus on inflation vis-a-vis -vis a dual mandate one, and we will try to, sh to study the impact of unconstrained fiscal policy vis-a-vis austerity rules such as those that have been implemented by the European uh, Union. Uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, overview of the result in case I get the, the red card uh, too much uh, fast, what we find is that the austerity rules are self-defeating. Why? Because they worsen the short-term performance of the system, they have an impact in the long run because they reduce innovation, they self-defeating because they don't improve the public budget but they let the debt over GDP ratio explode, and monetary policy can be effective not because of the interest rate channel, as most of standard DSG model was suggesting, but because of the credit channel, and in particular uh, on, on the fact that it can affect the procyclicality of credit in the system. And of course, income inequality is important and interacts with the type of policy that you're going to use. So these are some of the, of the paper, if some of you is, in, uh, is interested, and uh, well, we can discuss it later. So the structure of the model is, uh, is uh, pretty simple. So you have a capital good firm sector that produces machine tools and where innovation and the Schumpeterian part take place. These machines are sold to the consumption good firm that have investment plan. According to this investment plan, you have the Keynesian part, so to speak, of the model. The consumption good firm needs credits to finance their investment. So in this way, you have a connection between the real economy and the financial economy. Um, the banks also can buy government bonds and you will see there can also be banking crisis. The labor market in this version of the model is very stylized, but we have other versions where you have decentralized interaction and wide heterogeneity in the labor market. So just to give an idea of what's going on in each time step in the agent based model, uh, according to some macro prudential rule, the banks fix the amount of credit. You have innovation and uh, imitation and technical change taking place in the capital good firm sector. Then the consumption good firm invest and produce, they ask for credit, uh, they hire worker, then this worker consume the wage that they get. Uh, you have the, the market open. At the end of the period, you can compute the profits of each firm and you can determine whether a firm or a bank go bankrupt. You have an exit and an exit process and the machine are delivered at the end of the period. How does it work, this technical change in the, capi uh, in the capital good sector? Well, capital good firms, allocate to R&D a fraction of their past sales, so they use a sort of heuristics, and this money is split between innovation <coughs> and uh, imitation. Uh, they can imitate their competitor, and it is much more likely to imitate if the technological distance is small, and innovation is also driven by uncertainty and by possible uh, failure. Uh, once the, this innovation and imita imitation process are closed, the capital good firm choose which machine to produce, and uh, they try, they send a signal to po potential customer in, uh, uh, in the capital good market and they try to gain new customers and so on. They fix the price, applying a markup on the unit cost of production, to, to, which is a part of this uh, signal, so to speak. Uh, the consumption good firm, of course, needs to invest and invest, they have two types of investment. On the one hand, you have expansion investment, that is, these firms want to expand their capital stock. 
and this is driven by the demand expectation. So according to demand expectation, these firms have an idea of the desired level of production. If the capital stock is not enough, they invest. Uh, these expectations are pretty myopic in this model, but we have a version of the model where we have uh, this version of the model where we have extended the model for having heterogeneous type of expectation and also have uh, ordinary least square learning. And one of the general results that we get is that if the more you're using learning, the worse are the macroeconomic performance. Um, the other type of investment that you have is the replacement investment that is given your stock of capital. You want to scrap a machine and get a new machine with a better technology. In this case, this depends not only on the, how old is a machine, but also on the evolution of the technology within the system. So you can think about investment as important also for technological diffusion within the macroeconomic system. Uh, the banking sector, you have a fixed number of banks, they provide credit to the, to the firms uh, and the total supply of credit is, is uh, defined by Basel capital adequacy ratio plus an endogenous capital buffer, that is banks reduce the amount of credit once their balance sheet becomes more and more fragile and uh, the consumption good firms uh, need credit for finance production as well, that is paying for the workers and pay for the machine. So you have this credit is allocated on a packing order basis, so you can have endogenous credit rationing. And in this framework, is money is endogenous. In line, I, I quoted here this paper from the Bank of England on the topic, which was for me very interesting and very important. This money can generate banking crisis. Why is that so? Well, because firms can go bankrupt. By going bankrupt, they don't pay back for their loan. So this can create a problem for uh, the banks because it's going to reduce the profits of the bank. If this uh, massive bankruptcy of the firm uh, are, are so big that they destroy the net worth of the bank, also the banks go under, so the bank goes bankrupt. And in this case, you, you need the government to step in to save the bank. The labor market, as I was telling you before, is very stylized. You have a wage that is, depends on the evolution of inflation, productivity, and unemployment. But the interesting thing is that the labor market does not clear so you can have both Keynesian and voluntary unemployment, but also labor rationing. That is, the firm are not able to find workers when the economy is, uh, is booming. Uh, to close the, the model, so the macro framework, fiscal policy. In the standard scenario, there is simple a cost and tax rate on the firm's profit and an unemployment subsidy to unemployed people. Uh, you can compute the public deficit, which is unconstrained. So this is basically driven by taxes minus the expenditure for unemployment subsidy, the money that you need to use to save the banks, and the cost of the previous uh, debt. So you can track in each time step the evolution of the deficit over GDP and the debt over GDP. Monetary policies compute according to a Taylor rule, uh, where uh, the interest rate of the central bank is fixed according to inflation and the unemployment rate. So in this type of model, a stock flow consistent and typically all the macroeconomic quantities like GDP and national account, all simply by aggreg aggregating the microeconomic quantity within uh, the system. Okay, so the first thing that we did before doing policy exercise was to do a sort of quick and dirty validation of the agent-based model. Why? Because these models are more complicated than typically than the SG model. So in principle, we would like them to explain more things. Otherwise, there is no much point in using more complex things to, to do something that already you can get with a DSG. So we check the capability of this model to explain macroeconomic stylized fact and also microeconomic stylized fact because you have heterogeneity at the firm uh, level. So here, just to give you some idea that don't have too much time, just to show that the model is able to deliver endogenous growth and endogenous business cycle, these are the typical time series that you get in a simulation of the model. And one of the important characteristics of usually a gem-based model, but also this model, is that you can have the coexistence of mild downturn together with deep recession. This was one of the points of Stiglitz against the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. The dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model tried to have deep recession now, and they have to make very strong assumptions in terms of the nature of these shocks. In an agent-based model, you have the coexistence of this type of fluctuation in a natural way. Then uh, here, I think nobody is able to, to, to read, uh, but there is a, a list of the stylized fact that this model is able to reproduce, both macro and micro. At least I took it from, uh, from a well-known paper. So you have basically the co-movement of the macroeconomic variable 
uh, are respected at the business cycle uh, uh, frequency. You have boom and bust cycle in credit. Uh, and at the microeconomic level, you have uh, firm size distribution, firm growth rate distribution, which are in line with what you observe in microdata. You have heterogeneity in productivity, productivity persistency, firms invest in a lumpy fashion, and, uh, and so on. So, and this list of stylized facts is increasing over time because the, as every time you expand the model, you can uh, show more and more uh, things. So, after that, we thought the model is not so bad, we can try to do some policy experiments and in particular for on the fiscal side we tried the baseline scenario that I was telling you before with different type of austerity rules. So you have the stability and growth pact which tells you the deficit over GDP should be lower than 3%. Fiscal compact is nastier because you also have a debt reduction rule so if your debt is higher than 60% you have to add something to your surplus to repay for your debt. We had recession uh, escape clause as in the European uh, uh, treaty and in order to account for possible uh, critique to this type of model we take into account the so-called sovereign bond spread that was put in forward by people liking uh, expansionary austerity. What is the idea? The idea is that you need to do austerity because in this way you're gonna pay a lower spread on the <laughs> government bond. So here we link the interest rate that the government is paying uh, to the level of public debt over GDP. So if public debt over GDP is smaller, the interest rate is small, and as this is increasing, the, the government is going to pay a higher one. For the monetary policy, in the baseline, we have a tailored rule that focuses just on inflation. In dual mandate, you have inflation and unemployment. And at the end, you will see that there are some experiments where we deal with income distribution. So, uh, on, the, on the line, you have different fiscal rule. On the column, you have different monetary policy rule. And these are ratio vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark uh, uh, scenario. That's why in the no rule and TR pi, uh, this is the baseline scenario, you got a one. Uh, so if you, in this first table, we compute the volatility across different combination of monetary fiscal policy. And uh, I think I don't have the laser, right? Uh, there is no laser here. Okay. Uh, and if you want, basically what you see, if you read these things by uh, first column, second column, and so on, that if you go for austerity rule, the ratio is higher than one, which implies that the more you do austerity, the more you increase the volatility of, uh, uh, of the system. Uh, this, the, the, the negative impact of austerity doesn't occur only in volatility, but also in the likelihood of economic crisis, and also austerity result in higher unemployment uh, uh, rate. Uh, usually these results are robust to this sovereign bond spread channel, it is the last column uh, spread, so to speak. And what we find is that the, if you have a more expansionary monetary policy rule, this mitigates the impact of fiscal uh, rule. However, the performance of the system is still worse when you have a study that when you don't have. Uh, then we, we check what's going on to the public budget, because of course if you, if you do a very tough cure to the economy, uh, at least you would like that if the economy is suffering, you are able to put your public finance on a good trajectory. But this is not the case because usually austerity policies are self-defeating. So in some cases, the debt over GDP ratio explodes over time. It doesn't explode only when you have escape clause. Why? Because in the deep recession, you suspend austerity uh, policy. Uh, using an agent-based model, you can also consider... Ah, yeah, then we find that this result are robust also for different type of expectation rule. I don't have time, but we can discuss this uh, later because this could be a possible critique. Uh, and then we also move to the long run. As this model can uh, account both for business cycle and the long run growth, we wanted to study where um, austerity has an impact on the long run. And it appeared to be the case because especially uh, hard austerity policy reduce the long run performance of, uh, uh, of the system. At the same time, in line with the literature, monetary policy is not relevant for, uh, for growth. So what we did was, well, as we have an agent-based model and we have firms and we have data about the firm, we can zoom at the firm level to understand why austerity can be bad for growth. So this is typical run of the simulation. You can see that the population in this model is fixed. So the dash line is where austerity policy are there and GDP growth is lower. And this comes especially from the lower level of average productivity. 
uh, in the down panel you can see R&D expenditure and you can see that austerity policy reduced the expenditure in R&D in this uh, uh, system. Could you say something about the time scale? What would it it's usually a quarter. Yeah. yeah, there is always this problem with agent based model, but uh, we, we think that it's kind of quarter. Okay. Uh, then here are basically some statistics. So you, you see you have lower productivity, lower growth, higher unemployment rate, and then we zoom at the capital goods sector and uh, in the consumption goods sector. So what you can find is that once you have austerity policy, capital goods firms are less and less successful in uh, uh, innovating. And this result on the, on the one hand in a lower productivity growth in the capital goods sector and in a lower productivity dispersion. Why is that so? Well, because the less you are innovating, so the more the firm are equal. And this basically comes from an aggregate demand channel. As there is austerity, there is, the economy is, not, uh, is much more depressed, the capital goods sector has less and less money to invest in R&D and so they innovate less. This for innovation generation. Then by moving to the consumption goods sector, you can also focus on technological diffusion. And here what you get is that the, the fact that there is austerity reduces the investment rate of these consumption goods firms. So these firms slow down the, the acquisition of new a new machine with the state-of-the-art technology. And this, of course, reduces the productivity growth also in the consumption goods sector. That's also why you have a lower productivity dispersion and uh, the, you have this average duration of the best vintages that becomes longer. Why? Because the technology, all the technology stay longer within the market and within the uh, economy. The last series of, uh, of experiments that we did was constraining the policy with respect to inequality. So on the x-axis you have different level of markup. So the more you go to the right, the higher the income distribution goes to profit vis-a-vis -vis wages. So we are talking about functional income inequality. And we try with different type of fiscal policy. So what you get <laughs> from this result is that there is a sort of combination between inequality and fiscal policy. That is, for lower level of, of course, uh, austerity has always a negative impact in the short term, but this impact of austerity becomes bigger and bigger as the level of functional inequality increase in the system. Why? Because, of course, inequality reduces the level of aggregate demand and the impact of austerity further reduces the level of aggregate demand. But there are also some sort of, so to speak, tipping point uh, if you consider the long run performance. So for lower level of inequality, austerity is not going to considerably affect the long run performance of the system. This is the first plot in the top. But uh, after you pass some uh, level of inequality, you have a combination uh, reinforcing mechanism, positive feedback between inequality and fiscal policy, the austerity policy that also reduces the performance of the system. Um, just to say a couple of things about monetary policy. Is already red? Oh, sorry, ah. big button, ah, I didn't see the, the yellow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to finish in a couple of slides. I just want to see the, the, the impact of monetary policy from an income distribution. So you see that here that monetary policy does not affect the long run performance of the system. Uh, but of course, it has an impact also on the, uh, on the macroeconomic performance. And very often, the dual mandate works better than the standard Taylor rule. That is, the dash line is always uh, below. Also here you have an emergence of, so to speak, uh, tipping point. And uh, uh, the fact that this dual mandate uh, monetary policy works better than uh, the conservative one is a little bit different from the cost channel uh, theory provided uh, very often by macroeconomists. Why? Well, the idea is that if you have a dual mandate monetary policy, uh, the central bank are going to increase the interest rate during a boom when the unemployment level is very low. And the fact that the central bank is uh, increasing the interest rate during a boom boosts the profits, the profitability of the bank. So the banks are able to have higher profits, have sounder uh, <laughs> network, uh, a stronger balance. So in the next phase, when they're going to be the next recession, the banks are in a better position because they're using macroprudential reg uh, regulation to provide more credit to the firms where they mostly need it. So the channel that we find, the sort of credit channel of monetary policy, because when you have a dual mandate monetary policy, you reduce the pro-cyclicality of credit, which is one of the source of disturbances of our 
uh, modern uh, economy. What dual mandate you're using? Sorry? The dual mandate, what is it? What are the two mandates? Ah, yeah, the, the two mandates is that the interest rate depends on inflation, how, how much inflation is different from the target one. And the other one is how far unemployment rate is from the target one. And we use the unemployment rate because in an agent-based model, when you have technical change, it's very difficult to compute uh, the potential level of uh, output, and so the output gap. Okay, just to, to summing up, so I'm going to be perfectly in time, don't get to the red card. Uh, so we started with this model, different fiscal and monetary policy, and the main result was that higher level of inequality has a negative input of the system. Inequality interacts with fiscal and monetary policy. These austerity policies are self-defeating, they worsen the performance of the system in the short and in the long run. Why is that so? Because they reduce uh, the innovation rate, the technological diffusion within the system. This results are robust for different expectation rule. And we have a strong complementarity between inequality, expansionary fiscal policy, and between fiscal and uh, monetary policy. Okay. Great. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>